call his name Jesus. Oh, how I love. Come on, I got to see some smiles today. How I love calling the name of Jesus. Because Hallelujah. when you say the name of Jesus, every hey. knee shall bow and every tongue will confess the name of Jesus. Oh, get rid of that stinky attitude. Come on now. Oh, God is good. Come on, smile. If you don't do nothing, smile and say that God has been good. God has been good to me that he woke me up this morning and he started me on my way. Oh, Lord, I don't have to pride you. Oh, I ain't priding nobody because you're in the house of God. And in this house, in this house, oh, there's to be praise. There's to be glory. There's to be honor. Get rid of your stink attitude. Oh, come on now. You got nerve to come into the Lord's house. Oh, just throw your hands up and say, thank you, Jesus. 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 Oh, God. You didn't have to do it, but you did it anyway. You didn't have to do it, but you did it anyway. Oh, Lord, you took me out of the muck and mire. You took me out of the muck and mire. Say, when I look back, oh, boy, when I look back on what I used to be, oh, I thank God. I thank God. Oh, come on, when we say that name, God. I thank God for saving me. Somebody say, God, saving me. Oh, I can't have an attitude. Oh, no. Oh, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. So when I hear the song, Jesus, when I hear the song, Jesus, oh, it makes me get rid of the nastiness that I have inside of me. Oh, and I can just smile. Smile today. Turn around and smile to somebody. And say, God loves you. Say, God loves you. Oh, you, oh, oh, when you smile, you know what happens? You defeat Satan. Oh, when you smile, you defeat Satan. So just smile and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Spirit is in the house today. The Spirit is in the house today. Regardless of Satan, the Spirit is in the house today. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Oh, he felt it. He felt it. Oh. But the Spirit is in the house. Let us have the Spirit stay. Let the Spirit ruminate in this house. Let him fall upon us. Let it rain. Let it rain. Oh, let it rain. And so it's all about educating your people. It's all about education. Giving thanks and praise to the only wise God. Grace and peace. To the shepherd of this house. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak God's word before God's people. Standing here upon this throne, I am deeply humbled. May God continue to bless and, and love you. To the first lady and family, may God's grace continue to bless you always. To the, all clergy, organizations, congregates, congregants, family, visitors, friends, Special guests, I greet you in the precious, wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My title is, What Does God, What Does Jesus Expect from His Stewards? My text comes from Matthew 25. I know it's a read, but I've broken it down some. It's Matthew 25, 14 through 30, and it reads... For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. 
The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. So also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, see, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who, ha who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out that worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let us pray. Lord, you know our needs. You know the condition of our hearts. So come, come, Lord, fill us. Fill us with your love. Come, fill our lives with your grace and peace. Come, fill this service with your holy presence. Lord, hide me. Hide me, Lord. Oh, hide me. And allow your Holy Spirit to do a new thing in this church today. Please, Lord, don't allow, don't allow anyone who came here today to leave the same way they came. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. My strength and my redeemer. Happy Stewards Day. <laughs> Come on, happy Stewards Day. Come on. It's a celebration. I feel like singing Cool in the Gang. Celebrate. Sorry, 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 Pastor. Sorry, Pastor. Come on, it's a celebration. And so we ought to celebrate. Today we, we want to give thanks to our stewards for serving the church with the highest standard of excellence. They have diligently worked tirelessly throughout the year, especially without the praise of others, Amen. to ensure that God's house has been maintained properly. Amen. Stewards, please stand. Stewards, stand. Come on, stand. Let's go before them. Come on. Up in the front. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Show them some love. Everybody should be standing. It takes a lot to be a steward. Oh, a leader is hard. Come on, everybody should stand. Because one day you too will get that job. Come on. Come on. Show them some love. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Lord. 
Saints, at this time, let's take a few minutes and applaud them for a job well done, for their commitment and dedication. Job well done. Thank you, stewards. Oh, all right, let's, let's get to it. Yum, yum. Oh, I had this big vision because I want to give a backdrop of, of what the sermon is about. Jesus has left. We celebrated Resurrection Day. His disciples are in an array. They don't know what to do. Jesus is gone. But Jesus continually told them as he got to Jerusalem that he would die. But you know what? When you, when you lose your security, what do you do? Oh, my God! <laughs> it's going to end. And that's what the disciples felt. But Jesus knew he was leaving, and as he ascended, he left some instructions. And this is what he said. Everything is God's. The more I say it, the more I understand that I am not in charge of anything. When God entrusts us and gives us the responsibility to take care of something or someone, we must reciprocate his love back, placing faith in him. Underlying faith, faith, faith. What is man that thou art mindful of him, said King David. So, so what does Jesus expect of his stewards? And what is the responsibility of the steward? Let's get plain. A steward is someone who manages the possessions of others. So what he or she watches over is not theirs. It's the Lord's. If you think about it, we are all stewards of the resources, abilities, opportunities that God has entrusted to our care. And one day, all of us, underline, underline, all of us, will be called to give an accounting for how we have managed what God has given us. Come on. One day. And so in the backdrop, Jesus is giving his disciples a message that they will go through the end of times. Tribulation. Many preachers don't preach about that subject. Fire and brimstone. That God's coming back. And he's not taking everybody. Just because you say, Lord, Lord, doesn't mean you're going too. No, because Jesus will say, I don't know you. Come on. And, and, and so, so, come on, come on. So, so God has also entrusted his authority over to us as watching over his creation. And we are not allowed to, to rule over it as we see fit. Because, you know, we got a stank attitude. You know, stanky. Can't tell you. But like the servants in the parable of the talents found in Matthew 25, 14, and 30, we will all be called to give an account of how we have managed everything we have been given, including our time, money, abilities, information, wisdom, relationships, as well as authority. Now, that's a long line, right? Okay, but now let's talk about parables. Because Jesus hid, ingeniously, he hid the message about his kingdom in his parables. So the parable of the talent makes a comparison or a likeness to how we will give an account to the master as to how well we manage the things he has entrusted to us when he returns in his second coming. As Jesus ascended, those gospels were written. And the the disciples turned apostles thought Jesus was coming back yesterday. Come on, somebody say yesterday. That Jesus was coming back. But you know, he didn't. And they had to move on. So here, I read a story of a woman who had finished her shopping and returned to her car to find four men inside it. She dropped her shopping bags, drew a handgun from her purse, and with a forceful voice, she said, I have a gun, and I know how to use it. Get out of the car. (laughs) 
The men didn't wait for a second invitation. They got out and ran like crazy. The woman, understandably shaken, quickly loaded her shopping bags and got into the car. She just wanted to get out of there as fast as she could. But no matter how hard she tried, she could not get the key into the ignition. <laughs> then it hit her. This isn't my car. <laughs> she looked around, and indeed, her car was parked four or five spaces away. <laughs> she got out and looked around to see if the men were near. Uh, and so she loaded the bags into her car and drove to the police station to turn herself in. Isn't she nice? <laughs> However, the desk sergeant, after hearing her story, nearly fell out of his chair laughing. <laughs> oh, he pointed to the other end of the counter where the four men were reporting a carjacking by a woman with glasses and curly white hair. Now, less than five feet tall and carrying a large handgun. Of course, <laughs> there was no charges given, and I can't take credit for the story, the illustration. It comes from Greg Laurie. I love listening to him in the morning. Sometimes we have to have humor in our lives. So let's get this back to, I got to define some things. So what is a talent? A talent is a unit of measure. A talent could be gold, silver, or copper, each possessing its own value. Now, we're looking at value. You have value. In the parable, a talent is understood to be a large sum of money. Yet Jesus, in the story, wants a talent to represent something other than money in our lives. A talent is equal to about 6,000 denarii. Uh, since one denarii is a common laborer's daily wage, a talent would be roughly the equivalent to about 20 years' wages for the average worker. Somebody say, whoa, oh, man. So now this large uh, uh, amount of money, for this is a large amount of money for a servant, isn't it? Yet in the parable, many people have misinterpreted the meaning of the talent. This threw me for a curve when I researched because Jesus wanted the talent to represent things like God's word, the gospel of the kingdom of God, forgiveness of sin, and yes, his Holy Spirit. That's what he wanted us to focus on. So in Matthew 25 and 14 and 30, Jesus tells his disciples and those listeners whether believers or non-believers, they're out there too. They told him about the parable concerning a wealthy man who left three servants in charge of a substantial large sum of money. To each one, he gave instructions, put this money to work until I come back. So the parable presents uh, what the three servants did with their master's money. Verse 14 states, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man going on a journey who summoned his servants and entrusted his property to them. We learn that the master of the parable is Jesus, and he gives instructions to his servants as to how they are there to act while he returns. They were to watch and wait for Jesus' return. Somebody say, watch and wait. That's what we should do. So in verse 16, 17 tells us how the two servants made 100% profit. Somebody say, whoa. <laughs> okay, in your own style, of course. <laughs> now, on the master's investment, they doubled what the master had been entrusted to them. The first and second servant immediately put their master's money to work. Underline that and think about putting the money to work. Verse 18 tells us that the third servant did not care nor take interest in the task that the master assigned to him. He feared his master's wrath. What happens with fear? Hmm. And he was unwilling to risk loss. So he had literally dug a hole, wrapped the money, 
that he had been uh, given and placed it in that hole. Now, when the master returned, the third servant simply returned the sum of money that was initially given to him. Now, there was some history about the Jews and, and money. In the Jewish culture, it's customary that if a person was given money and they choose to do nothing with it, then that decision was within their rights. Wow. So we constantly slap that man who did nothing, but it was customary. The servant thought it best that he not lose his master's money. However, today it would be considered inappropriate for that same third servant to have have to not have invested his master's money. Verse 19 tells us that the master returns and decides to settle the account with his servants. Settle the account with his servant. Isn't that similar? That one day he's coming back. Just as one day Jesus is going to return and all of his elect could get deeper and say his predestinated, but I won't. <laughs> that elect will have to settle their accounts with Jesus. So verses 20 to 23 tells us that the first servants are enthusiastic. Yeah, we did the right thing about the master's return, and they are commended by the master for their good stewardship as well as rewarded for their faithfulness. Somebody say faithfulness. So when Jesus returns, he's going to determine if whether or not his servants were trustworthy. Say trustworthy. We can see in the parable that in the eyes of the master, the first and second servant have proven themselves to be reliable. Say reliable. So when Jesus returns, he will judge his servants according to their faithfulness rather than on their usefulness. Whoa, really? He will judge his servants on their sincerity and not on their successes. Oh, you're correct. Because we keep thinking it's about success. I'm a successful person. <laughs> Jesus will judge his servants on the righteousness of their hearts rather than on the degree of their opportunities. Therefore, as God's servants, we must maintain our diligence. Somebody say diligence. In how we perform our work and services for God. Diligence is what's needed. In the parable, the master elevated servants one and two based on how well they dispensed their responsibilities while the master was away. A faithful servant also learns how to become a good sower. Whoa, where are you getting that, chef? So in verse 24, 30, tells us that the third servant accused the master of exploitation and then gives the master his account of why he failed to act. Upon witnessing this, the master rebuked the third servant for his poor stewardship and punished him for his faithlessness. The master then called the third servant wicked, lazy, slothful. That's some harsh words, isn't it? Whoa. However, we can conclude from the third servant's inaction that he did not invest the master's money because he held fear and doubt in his heart. How many times has the pastor's talked about this in a series? And he, he mentioned two things, fear and doubt, and how they stymie, they hinder the servant. This was the reason why the third servant failed to invest his master's money. He was faithless and did not, this is a big one, trust the master. If you don't do anything, you got to trust the person, right? Come on. I'm going to work hard for you, but I first have to do what? Trust you. It's even in a marriage. If I'm going to respect you, I have to trust you. So as a result, the third servant was punished for his inability to act. God wants his servants to act. Somebody say act. And so, however, if we fail to act based on a lack of faith in the Lord, then in the end, we will be judged harshly. Verse 28 and 29 tells us that whoever rightly improves what is given to him or her shall receive more. 
or shall be rewarded. But he that does not improve what he is given, then he shall be rewarded, not rewarded. So what this says is, and we've heard it earlier, that if you don't use it, those talents, then you lose it. You've heard that term before, right? I'm sure Ashley, as an entrepreneur, can tell us. <laughs> use it or what? Lose it. So now, verse 30 tells us that as a consequence for being unfaithful, the third servant is sent to a place called the outer darkness. Somebody say the outer darkness. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Say weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, so that don't sound too happy, do it? <laughs> don't sound too happy. Uh-oh. Darkness is uncomfortable and frightful. In the darkness, no man can work. If we, place, uh, if we are placed in the outer darkness, then we will not receive the light of heaven. The outer darkness seems to be a place where unfaithful servants go when they fail to obey their master's commands. So, okay, you're looking at me now and say, okay, brother, come on, give me the skinny. <laughs> what is it all about? You, you've laid it all out, right? So the master gave a large amount of money to his each servant in keeping with each servant's ability. Stick with that. Everybody's different, aren't they? Yes, Jesus believes in equal opportunity. <laughs> That's what God says. That's what God does. He allows us to support him with our gifts, talents, and abilities. However, it's up to us to demonstrate what we're going to do with these gifts because in the end, what did I say? When Jesus returns, he will, we're going to account for our action or our inaction. The first two servants were faithful in how they, they cared for their master's money. However, in contrast, the third servant's action lacked faith. And the master saw this as the servant being worthless. That's a problem. I don't want God to see me as worthless. The master then took away the one talent and gave it to the first servant. The master took away the third servant's talent because he failed to do anything with his talents. And as a result, because he sat on his talent, <laughs> he was punished. How many of us sit on our talents? <laughs> Come on, plenty of gifts, plenty of abilities. And yet many of us sit on them. Or how many of us make up excuses for not acting? I look at those excuses, too, because we're full of them. And as humans, guess what? We can rationalize anything. So we can conclude that the Holy Spirit, oh, man, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit and his assignment and his responsibility, this indwelling of the Holy Spirit gives gifts to everyone. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. These gifts vary from person to person. Not all of us are given the same gifts. However, we are going to give an account of these gifts because in the end, what did I say? Jesus will come back in his second advent and he's going to make an accounting. We will all be held accountable for our faithfulness towards getting the job done. And that's what our stewards have done. They got the job done. And you know what? Being a leader is a lonely job. As a retired major from the United States Army and a principal, I can tell you there were decisions that I had to make that people didn't love me. <laughs> they didn't love me. But you know what? It's, uh, uh, you're going to have to make tough decisions and not be loved. I hate to say it. It's like a parent. When the kid wants something and you say no, oh, man, was that a soft no? <laughs> or was it a hard maybe? <laughs> it's hard to say no. But we've got to do it if we're going to get the job done. Jesus wants us to work. In the parable, Jesus was referring to the kingdom of God. Oh, man, we heard so much about this kingdom. As citizens of God's kingdom, we must understand that our lives are not our own and that we cannot live according to our own wishes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
not thy will, not my will, but thy will be done. Somewhere I heard that, maybe in a prayer. I heard it. So we must continue to work like those faithful stewards in the parable who faithfully used their master's assets to gain a profit while they waited on Jesus' return. So now deeper, Jesus has commissioned each of us to go out into the world with the gospel until he returns. This includes using our gifts by going out and witnessing. Somebody say witnessing. Into the unknown. Now, there's fear in going where? Into the unknown. When I first got married, I was like, okay. (laughs) You're going into the unknown. (laughs) But there's compromise, right? That we're going into the unknown, but with what? Our faith. Somebody say faith. Come on. Going into the unknown with what? Faith. Faith in who? God. And so our aim is to prosper into God's kingdom. Most of the time, however, here we go again. We tend to look for excuses when times are hard or difficult. How many of us run for cover? Oh, shoot, church is in an uproar. Got to run. I don't want to be a part of that. (laughs) How many of us run? We forget that the Lord has given us abilities, you know, those gifts, opportunities, and time fitting for us to accomplish the work. Don't be afraid. God is aware that of how, how much he is assigned to us. God knows what he wants us to accomplish. And if God has assigned us a particular task, then he will ensure that we are equipped to accomplish it. Hallelujah. He's not going to give you more than what you can do. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. You know. Come on. You're looking at your neighbor saying, well, will he clap? (laughs) Will she? (laughs) That does make a point. And if we are faithful with a little, God will give us more. So regardless of the profit made, the first two servants received equal commendation and rewards because of their faithfulness. Harping on faithfulness, and there must be something about it. They were given equal opportunity based on their abilities, although the third servant disobeyed his master's simple instructions. Simple instructions. The third servant was singled out because he failed to act according, and as a result, he received severe consequences. Isn't that what Jesus is going to do when he returns? He's going to give his accounting. Jesus is going to judge his servants equally. Somebody say equally. Some are going to be happy while others are going to cry. It's a sad moment when he returns. So let's look at the parable of the talents from a different perspective. Where because of the servant's faith the master allowed them to enter into the joy of the Lord's kingdom. Oh, my God, the reward, entering into God's kingdom. However, God does not allow us to enter into his kingdom with just these talents and money and education. God allows us entrance into his kingdom because of our faithfulness and obedience towards him. God doesn't want us to work, just work. He wants us to faithfully do the work of Jesus. Imitate Christ. This is what Jesus expects from his servants. So now wrapping it up. As Christians in the 21st century, we need to embrace this larger biblical view of stewardship, which goes beyond church budgets or building projects. Though important, underline, underline, it's important. However, it doesn't connect everything we do with what God is going to do in the world. Hallelujah. It doesn't. We've missed the priority. We need to be faithful stewards of what God has given us within those opportunities he's presented to us in order to give him the glory. Say, giving God the glory. Not me. Giving God the glory. We have a choice. Here we go. As to whether we will accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior 
or deny him and be condemned. We must faithfully use our gifts and abilities to serve our church. Somebody say serve the church. Without what? Fears or reservations. So what does Jesus expect of his stewards? Jesus wants his, wants his stewards to take a leap of faith. Say leap of faith. And serve God for the common good in order to build his kingdom. We all should desperately, desperately long to hear the master say what he exclaimed in Matthew 25 and 21. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou has been faithful over a few. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Happy Stewards Day. Amen. Praise the Lord. Put your hands together and bless the Lord. Oh, come on. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. What does Jesus expect of his stewards? Amen. Amen. At this time, the altar of the Lord is open. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to invite you in to have a relationship with the Lord. Amen. We should never come into the house of the Lord without giving an extension of the relationship that you can have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, come on. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, we invite you to come. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is a special day, a day of the stewards, and we ask also that you, even if you're interested in being a steward, we have that opportunity when we have our church conference, but we want to say to you that now is the time we should be a part of the leadership, amen, as we enter our conference here. Praise the Lord. So thank you, Rev ah, I mean, Reverend. Thank you, Evangelist Anthony Shepherd. Amen. Put your hands together for him. Amen. Put your hands together. Amen. God bless you. Did you get a word today? Amen. Did you get a word? Amen. Thank you, stewards. Put your hands again for these wonderful stewards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Amen. Remember the meetings that we have afterwards. Stewards, remember the checks for conference and for the delegates. Everybody's standing if you're able to stand. If not, don't worry about it. Let's all stand for, as we sing our doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That's right. What does Jesus expect of his stewards? He expects his stewards to continue to work and obey his commands. Yes, by using your gifts, talents, and abilities, you can help build God's kingdom. So then, when he returns, he will say, well done. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory, with exceeding joy to the only wise, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And the saints say...
Brother Frank. All white PD is. All white PD means Sister Kim. All white PD is. All white PD is. Please meet Sister Kim ASAP. All white. Oh.
asking you all to please let me start this meeting. I want to go too. I got tickets. In fact, you get a present. I'm glad you said. Is it? Yes, ma'am. Let's open our our meeting with a prayer. <clears throat> Lord. <clears throat> Okay. Lord, in the beginning, you gave us dominion over the earth and gave us <clears throat> change on the care of, of it. Please forgive us for not taking better care and setting forth good examples for those who will follow after us. We confess that we have <clears throat> been lax on our stewardship effort in keeping this earth clean. We, re <clears throat> we repent of this disobedience that we may now be about your business <clears throat> in making this place a more desirable place to live and to expect others individually and collectively increase our knowledge and encourage and courage to stand for what is right in your in your name amen now we're going to sing stand up stand up for jesus do we know that okay stand up for jesus the he soldier of the cross lift high his warrior banner it must not suffer loss stand up stand up for jesus ye soldiers of the cross lift high his warrior banner it must not suffer loss. Amen. The, the end of our